Okay, I think we are live now. Just a few of us. So I just want to make sure that uh, we are all in and we are ready for this amazing discussion on the civil society resuscitating the global trust crisis. I think trust is the key element for everything. You need trust in relationships. Otherwise, you will never have a long-term relationships. We need trust in companies. If we don't have a, a trust within the people working in a company, uh, there's no uh, employee loyalty and we don't go ahead and, and grow that company. If within the market, there's no trust towards the company, there's no good, there's no clients or, or, or uh, customers who will trust the company to buy things. So trust is everything. In the and the same with trust to government or trust to uh, our people that matter in, in our governments. So on, on that, um, I would like to introduce you to this uh, amazing topic that we have that is uh, civil society, can it resuscitate the global trust crisis that we are going through? You see, globally, there has been a gradual reduction of trust in parliaments and governments and judiciary systems and other institutions as well as their own failings in the governments and in corruption. So can non-for-profit organizations and especially civil society uh, through social impact uh, rejuvenate this very needed uh, element to create a society? Without trust, we have very little to, to hope for. We have on the line uh, Karen Guggenheim, founder and chief executive officer of World Happiness Summit. And we have uh, Lawrence Bloom, secretary general, B Earth Foundation, United Kingdom. And we have Rai Barat Barcott, co-founder and chief executive officer of With Honor in the United States. Each of you uh, starting with uh, Karen, will introduce yourself for a few, for maybe a minute, and then uh, tell us what are your what are your thoughts on these premises, and what are the challenges we are facing. Each one will have uh, ten minutes to talk, or five, six minutes to talk, and then we'll ask you questions that arise. Excellent. Karen? Thank you so much, Lara. Thank you, uh, everyone, for your time and being here today. Uh, like Laura mentioned, I am um, I run an organization called the World Happiness Summit Wahasu, and what we do is that we bring the leading experts of the science of happiness and well-being to a global audience, including policymakers. So the the idea of trust and fostering trust is very near to our hearts and our mission. Laura, you're exactly right in your introduction that it's very difficult to have any kind of relationship, sustainable relationship, without trust. So trust is a key element. Um, our, our mission is to bring about uh, the knowledge, the awareness, and, and the teachings from the science of well-being. And so um, talking about virtues and trust is actually is, is, is an important one. And then also in a practical way, what does trust look like in practice? Right, because some of these uh, these uh, concepts, perhaps we don't really we, we've um, moved away from, or we don't know um, how these interplay in the workplace and education uh, in ju education systems. And so, in particular, uh, our mission is to bring this learning to children. So through our partnerships with. Uh, happier schools curriculum program, for example, we bring this uh, learning into into schools and into curriculum to help uh, is students uh, learn uh, these these practices, these, these these virtues, and to give teachers also the support that they need to teach children. Um, I'd like to say as well that uh, part of the motto of, of of what we do is to try to move from an I culture to a we culture. And so in a we culture, we also foster the mattering of others 
and we add value as we feel valued. So it's very important, particularly during increasing challenging times and heightened uh, st stressful contexts that we see how our behavior and our actions impact others. So trust also has a very big component in that um, kind of interrelated relationship with our com in our communities, in our cities, in our global communities. Um, we support systems change in particular through through education and building community because in order to make this sustainable we do need to create a communities around well-being and also a language that supports us so we can measure so i'm really glad to be part of this conversation today with all of you and i'm here to learn from you as well thank you You're muted. You're muted, Laura. Sorry. Thank you. So, Lawrence, do you want to share your point of view of why? Um, what is your point? Uh, you, what do you think about this topic and the the challenges we have ahead on this? So, I'm hoping you can hear me. That would be a good start. Excellent. Um, uh, so. It's interesting uh, what you're saying about trust breaking down everywhere in, at the level of government and so on. And I'm just wondering, I mean, this is a well thought out title. Um, it's almost a kind of wish for a devolution of power. Um, because as government seems to be meandering in all different directions, it's actually the people on the ground, the people in civil society, the NGOs that are working with civil society, who understand what the problems are and really can get to grips with those levels of problems. So it's my um, belief and my uh, uh, interest to see how one can promote that level of um, activity at the, at the grassroots level, if you like. Um, I think levels of trust at the higher level uh, are just it, it, dissolving. And so it's going to be left to the NGOs and I also think the IGOs. So I run an intergovernmental organization. We work with NGOs uh, extensively, um, but we actually provide the piece that's in touch with government. Um, so we can help direct government at the level that we get information from our NGOs who are on the ground who understand what's really happening down there. Very often you, under, you, 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 you speak with government, they have no idea really because they have no experience of what's really happening in, 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 in grassroots level. So we have kind of bridge between government and, um, and uh, NGOs working with civil society. Um, and I see that that could be an interesting key. There needs to be a greater relationship of understanding between, between um, what's going on literally on the ground and what's really needed to policies that sometimes seem totally devoid of any intelligence with regard to what's needed. So, you know, I thank you for the opportunity to talk. I think this is a really important subject. And it's one that the Earth Foundation, where I happen to be um, uh, privileged to be um, Secretary General, is making a difference by getting in front of government those issues that are really most important. Excellent. Thank you very much for those uh, points. I think that they were very well thought out. And I think that uh, Rai Barkok can also share his uh, point of view on this. Well, thanks, Laura, uh, Karen, and, and Lawrence. Nice to be with you again. Uh, our, my perspective is really uh, from that of a um, uh, entrepreneurial and nonprofit perspective of an organization that's trying to rebuild trust in a area of particular breakdown of trust, which is uh, is is familiar to everybody that was watching the television on January sixth. Uh, my organization, With Honor, is an organization that helps uh, elect and support uh, principled veterans, uh, individuals who served in the armed forces, served their country in the United States from both parties, from all walks of life and from all dis congressional districts, who take a pledge to serve with integrity, civility, and courage in our Congress and meet every two weeks across party lines. Um, nothing is going to get done 
I believe, as a one-party solution in the United States. We have got to find out ways to, to bridge this you know, massive, and I think the word tribal has been used before uh, in, in, a, in sort of an accurate sense in terms of um, uh, a lot of these divisions are, are just fueled by an incredible amount of emotion. Uh, it's easier to, to, to uh, cast aspersions on somebody if you've never met them, if you've never spoken with them, and if you have nothing in common with them. And so that is why we, we really anchor on the shared experience of service. And in this case, it's service in the military, but we are big believers of national service and, and uh, with honor just advocated successfully for an expansion of AmeriCorps, the uh, organization that pro- promotes national service across the, the country by 50% in this latest COVID package. So we're very pleased by that. But the service uh, creates a common bond. When I served in the Marine Corps, I served with Marines from every walk of life, every socioeconomic status. Didn't ma- matter who your mommy or daddy was, you were there for a common cause, which was to put something and serve something that was greater than yourself. So that is uh, with honor.org, the organization that we're working on that we that, that, that convenes this group. It's a small group of about 25 uh, members in the U.S. House of Representatives, and they are working again every two weeks. You don't hear about it, but they're sitting, talking to each other, and trying to get the hard work done of, um, of getting the, the country in, the, in a better place. Thank you. Those are really great and great initiatives and, and very descriptive of what are the challenges we are going through. But the real issue now is uh, we, we always, life is full of challenges, especially with the issues of trust. So in, in your NGOs and your IGOs, what is it that you are, uh, what tools, what initiatives, what uh, suggestions you are doing now, but what are you, what would you plan to really uh, 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 harness a better, uh, improve the trust in, in our society, especially in people, in families, in communities, in governments, in voters? Uh, should we start with uh, Karen? Sure, thank you, Laura. Um, like I mentioned before, for us, a, very, a, a key pillar is education, right? So we do that with the, uh, with the school districts and to bring this on the, on the, on the level of um, even beginning in uh, kindergarten, first grade, all the way to 12th grade. And we do that with, with our conference as well, our public conference. And in particular, there's an area that I would love to uh, really optimize, and that's the, pri- the private government meeting we have. We call it the H20. And we've had three, three of these since 2017, last, in the last two years, unfortunately, because of COVID, we weren't un- unable to, to, uh, to meet in person. But the beautiful thing about this is to bring these, um, these concepts and these principles, particularly how you know, to surface them, to surface values and how these are really important to a country agenda and how it ties into well-being economics and how we can measure, measure country success beyond GDP. And so lack of trust certainly has impacts to a country's uh, economic well-being and social well-being, right? And so um, there's, we would love to expand this meeting to include more, uh, more member countries and to have really an, an involved uh, conversation and a, a pledge to, to bring this to policy leaders and to, um, to government officials because it matters. I live in Miami, We're, we have a new mayor, um, started an initiative called Thrive 305. That's the, the, the area code for, for Miami. And it's really looking at the sustainability of the ecosystem, but also the well-being of the, of the community and taking into account the business community and the, um, the, the, the sustainability of the environment, as well as um, how citizens are doing um, in, in a social way. And I'd like to see this be part of the of a global conversation, increasingly so, because um, there's a need, there's 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 a thirst for it as well. Um, just because of COVID, I think it's highlighted the necessity for us to start measuring success in a different way. And Uh, 
in a practical way, like I said before, so that we can do something about it. There's training, there's possibilities, there's dialogue where I was talking about a, a super important initiative that is happening in Congress in the United States. And so um, we can bring this idea as well of positive, a positive peace. So in, in, in conflict countries, it's not only about Yes, it's important to go into peace, but what does po positive peace means? How do we then build with each other? How do we sit on a table around each other? So it's not enough to stop fighting, but then how can we um, foster growth in a country and in a society that's been injured? And so the very first bridge to that is really trust. Exactly. I mean, this is a very important what you just said. And also in your in your environment, you're really fo focusing on on education of the young uh, of the young people. But uh, I would like to hear from Ryan and, and, and Lawrence about, you see, the young will be older in maybe 15, 18 years, but we don't have that much time for climate change, for trust. So what is it that, we, that the two of you can say, yes, we're doing now? These are the tools, these are the suggestions, this is the hope we have. Lawrence, you want to share? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're in a world which is breaking down. And, and intelligently, we have to look at what's breaking through, what's breaking down, what's wanting to emerge, what's wanting to be, to be born. Uh, we're midwives, everybody on this panel, everybody yeah. listening. We're midwives of a new age. And part of that new age, certainly for the Be Earth Foundation, is to look at those unique opportunities of what's breaking through, what's breaking down, to nurture them, nourish them, bring them to the attention of government in a way that we can manifest them. Now, this, to me, I, I have a specific interest in children. Um, you can't talk about peace without talking about the education of children. So, Karen, you and I are more on the same page you can possibly imagine. Um, and self-esteem. Children through this uh, uh, pandemic uh, have gone through uh, isolation and, and many difficulties that could uh, could leave uh, many scars. One of the one of the initiatives that we've decided to make global. So we like to look at something which has worked, something that's breaking through, that's working, that needs globalizing. And what we chose. Um, was a project that we call Trash for Tunes. Um, this is where in Paraguay, um, in the poorest city, an inspired teacher took um, the children to a rubbish tip where they actually took rubbish that they could make into instruments. And not only did they make amazing instruments, but they actually learned how to play them. And they appeared at the Albert Hall. Um, so we are taking that idea in Paraguay. With another hat, I co-founded um, uh, a major organization, major for-profit organization that has a joint venture with uh, a major uh, music company. Uh, and I have access to many of the art, senior artists today who are in many ways the high priests of today. So uh, we can get them behind our initiatives. It gets everybody's attention. Um, in this case, we're going to take Trash for Tunes and the children's stories, and we're going to replicate it in at least four uh, South African, uh, South American countries. As soon as we do that and that's successful, it'll be eight. Then it'll be Africa. This has to be about self-esteem. It has to be about um, about children who learn to trust the system because they were part of a system that brought them self-esteem and that brought them uh, a significant recognition. You know, every child needs recognizing in, in some way. So I understand that, you know, uh, that um, these things are challenges. I wish I could make it global on day one, but we have to start somewhere. And that's, that's one of our major initiatives at the moment. It is with children. It is to get them um, uh, aligned with principles of retrusting the system, that actually there are initi initiatives out there that serve them. Thank you, Lawrence. That was very interesting. I, you know, hearing the fact that, that music, your know, musicians are the high priests is something that we will come back. And, uh, but before I'd like to hear Rai's uh, comments about uh, what, what is his organization doing and how, and then we'll go back to, to that point. 
Thanks. I love that comment on, on the high priest uh, and priestesses, uh, whatever the, the uh, female version would be uh, these days. Uh, you know, our, our vantage point and really my vantage point on thinking about trust is that you, you have to have the structural systems in place with regard to better education. It's as, as um, uh, was mentioned earlier by Karen, uh, our vantage point and our, our aperture from with honor is to really focus on leadership and leadership in both the short term and the long term. Uh, we are a U.S. based organization. We're focused in Congress, which is among the most polarized and like, sort of least trusted institutions. There's actually a survey in the United States that had uh, last year uh, Congress's trust in the United States dipped beneath that of used car salesmen for the first time uh, in, in history. Uh, so, so, uh, so there's there's a big there's a big need there's a big problem there. What we've seen is that uh, the the ability to frankly get elected, uh, especially if you are younger, and most of the the veterans that we support from both parties are younger, is um, uh, is very difficult because of the soaring costs uh, to run for office uh, again in the United States. This is largely a, a you know a U.S. centric issue in particular. Um, but the costs have just risen dramatically. So, uh, so our organization focuses on lowering those barriers to entry, recruiting and training really capable people who, who are going into it um, with the mentality of serving something larger than themselves. It doesn't mean that they're not selfless or self-interested. I think you, 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 know, you have to be uh, to survive in a, in a pretty uh, uh, difficult environment like politics in the United States. But it means that they have in their mind their order of priorities and that they can actually live with integrity and civility and courage in a place that will test that every every day. Um, so so that, that for us, it's really leadership focused. But I think, um, you know, the points on, on, on education and communication and marketing are, are all parts of the equation as well. Thank you, Ray. I think that you're right. Leadership is everything and training uh, leader uh, training youth to be leaders, educating youth to be leaders is is key. Leaders that believe in trust and believe in the values of of trust. And um, can we go back to the issue of uh, of music because uh, uh, music is the one that creates revolutions many times. Look what happened in Russia. Like the Beatles got in early on and it started to bubble up ideas of of freedom and. Uh, so how do you think um, uh, music can actually uh, bring uh, the concept of trust in people or, 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 uh, and, and have you seen this happen? Uh, yeah, so maybe if I, I, I can go first here. Um, what interested me initially was, um, if you know the story of Estonia, they sang the Russians out of Estonia. It's the most amazing story. If you, if you don't know it, you should no. check it out. Yeah, it's an amazing story. And they still have their folk uh, uh, ceremony once a year now. It's, it's, it's an amazing story. The influence of music is phenomenal. I don't know anybody who, who when they listen to John Lennon's Imagine, for that moment, just one moment, don't just imagine what it could be like. Um, and so... Uh, the pop stars today, so many of them, are, are really influencers. They are the major influencers. Um, there was a time, I remember, I'm old enough, just, when politicians, we hung on every word that a politician would say. Um, now we just hope, have to hope they're coherent enough to, uh, to be intelligible. So um, that was rude, I apologize. Um, so I think what I've been doing is been working with some of the major artists in, uh, in music to come behind these initiatives and to, and to address their fan base and to get their fan base enrolled. Because trust is one thing, but you have to reach as large an audience as you can. And uh, two of the artists we're working with have um, fan base in excess of 80 million. I mean, this is just huge critical mass, huge critical mass. And so the IGO is working on a number of ways to see how we can harness that, that energy 
And um, my belief is most celebrities do want to make a difference. They do want to have an impact. Um, uh, and so we're in a unique position to, 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 to have a direct conversation. Um, and to and to um, follow up on that, but but you know where that's a possibility, uh, I think it's uh, an incredible opportunity, and so it's one that the Earth Foundation we're taking in whatever way we can. That is uh, fascinating, and and definitely will be checking in on that uh, about uh, how music has. I know it has changed Russia, uh, but most probably it could have has changed other other countries as well. But let's go circle back to the issue of, of leadership. And, um, and Karen, in your initiatives, is leadership one of the main courses as well that brings in happiness and trust? And how do you deal with that? And how do you manage that to, to, to grow, grow trust in people? Absolutely, Laura. Let me just, before, before I answer your question, uh, circling back with the, uh, with the music, um, narratives are quite powerful and, and lyrics are narratives. So the stories that we tell ourselves and that we tell others, you know, we are all really storytellers. And the way that we process history, whether it's ours or a collective history, has a big impact. So storytelling is a huge component, actually, the, the science of storytelling and what the impact is around that is a big component of also of, of the work that we do to surface, again, people and connect them with an awareness of what are you telling yourself and what are you telling um, about others. So for, you mentioned um, the beautiful song, uh, Lawrence, um, Imagine. And so that's a beautiful narrative to tell oneself imagination, optimism, hope, particularly during these times. So imagine that we could trust each other. Imagine that we could act in a trusting way. We haven't talked about action, right? So to have trust, you have to act in a way that deserves trust because trust is earned through action, that your words match your actions. Um, now, leadership, I love, love this topic because it's so incredibly important right now to really identify what what are the characteristics of the leaders that we want to encourage? And we want servant leadership. And for some reason, we have come to think of a leader not being a servant. And, and it's so bizarre because, you know, th these are the attributes that are really impactful in movement building and in a changing of a paradigm um, is having a leader who is vulnerable and is acting in a compassionate way and can take action. And that doesn't mean that for some reason, again, we in the workplace and in, in, in politics and in government, we think that leadership can't be um, vulnerable or compassionate, that it has to be aggressive. And we can really take action um, that is kind and compassionate and at the same time quite impactful and action driven. That doesn't mean that you um, that you have to accept everything that everybody is, 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 is saying, but you, you need to listen. And so I think that's something else. So throughout, th throughout our trainings and our, our conference is really a train the trainer conference. It's science-based. And so there's a lot of, um, um, information that goes in there. And then we supplement through in e either individualized organizational training or individual training and, and other events. Um, and that's where, we we also we have like a chief happiness officer certificate program that teaches leadership in the workplace and it's a funny title right but guess what a hundred years ago maybe ceo or cfo was kind of strange that you would have that but it makes sense because we need to have you know a special department that leads on the different things whether it's operations marketing finance etc so we need to have well-being officers in in uh, in organizations we need to have that also in government you know, who is, and it's not uh, uh, an addition to, you know, it needs to be an independent and carefully thought out position so that we can encourage and model the leadership that we want in our workplaces, in our schools, in our communities and government. But if we're not purposeful because of our biology, we are not gonna get there. We have a negativity bias we're fighting against. So we tend to focus on the negative and not the positive. And that's just biology, it happens to every human being. Um, and we tend to ruminate on bad things versus good things. And what happens is that it's not about having rose colored glasses. It's about looking at the whole of reality. And in the whole of reality, there are many things that are going well. 
but we need to look at those because I, I forget who said this, one of the panelists mentioned this earlier, that we need to copy what works. And so we need to look out for the good as well. We've identified the bad, but from a strengths perspective, leadership needs to foster um, understanding, needs to foster a, a, a safe environment where people trust to share their opinions and needs to lead uh, through a servant and compassionate uh, style. And we need to identify what, what that looks like so we can begin to, um, to measure and promote leaders who exemplify that. Fantastic. I, I, I really like the idea that you mentioned about uh, chief uh, happiness officers, but are there chief uh, happiness officers in governments? I know there was one in, in So and, uh, I think you, you cut off for one I'm moment. Sure. Yes, uh, in Dubai also had, had, had a, a, a chief, uh, uh, a minister of happiness. So um, yes, some countries are beginning to do that. For example, the UK has a minister of loneliness in 2018 and started measuring, you know, so it's about measuring. Started mm -hmm. to see how this was so impactful to the society and this was be before COVID. Can you imagine um, the, the isolation and the impact of loneliness in the United States? They've already identified the, the next a, a pandemic is a mental health pandemic. But the amazing thing is that we have research and we have framework, frameworks to, do, to make a difference now. It's a matter of paying attention to it, funding. I'm sure that Rai knows about how difficult it is to get these, things, these initiatives funded um, in the United States. And, uh, but we have th these conversations that we're having here today, I think, are the right way to go. We just have to demand more. Thank you, Carrie. This is very, very interesting, very enlightening. And, and if we imagine if every country should ha has a wellness officer, uh, uh, a ministry, and then companies have one, uh, we will definitely ha go into the move in the right direction. And, and, and Rai, can you tell us more about your leadership and how does that really uh, enhance uh, trust and, 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 and the positives that we are looking for? Because, you know, the SDGs goal is 2030 and we might, uh, how do we get there? Yes, well, definitely leadership's got to be a part of it. And I just love the framework of happiness. I can, I can say with, uh, with great certainty that there is not a lot of happiness in the U.S. Congress uh, where we're focused. And, and that's because the, um, the environment is so uh, caustic, uh, but it's also because the, um, uh, the, the job itself is extremely difficult. And so uh, I think, you know, this word that Karen used of servant leadership is really important. It starts with education. It starts with the values that are instilled by those of us who are fortunate to have had great parents, great parents, mentors. And, and we need to cultivate a, frankly, a culture that respects and honors uh, service again, not just honor the next Instagram founder, or um, and the hats off to that individual for uh, you know creating a great but 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 doesn't just celebrate the um, you know the, the 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 move into the private sectors etc. Service in itself is a noble profession. Um, politics can be it's, it's always going to be uh, a rough sport, but can be incredibly noble and incredibly fulfilling. It might not be a path to happiness every day. But it will be fulfilling. And when you think about your life and what you, what, what you try and achieve, that's a really important component to getting things done in the interest of, of, um, of making the world a better place. So, uh, yeah, so I just, uh, you know, servant leadership, it's a big part of what we do with honor. Uh, we look to, to really uh, find individuals that have that mentality who have already served their country and are willing to, uh, to serve it again and then support them, help lower those barriers of entry so that they can be in positions to start making decisions, uh, particularly in, 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 with regard to the U.S. government, um, that need to be need to happen now. You know, we haven't essentially passed through regular order a budget in the United States for for uh, the better part of 15 years. Um, it's it's uh, it's an incredibly dysfunctional situation, and it, it matters for America, but it also matters for uh, for the world and the, the issues that we're so interconnected. With. Thank you, because, uh, you know, as many of you heard from when we met last time, that uh, 
the organization that I lead, Women for Solutions, what we are really focusing is on what is that every of the seven, eight billion people in this world have to understand what is a caring economy. Because as humans, we were, um, we exist as a culture because we, we have cared for our kids to grow up, for the elderly, for the, for the sick. Otherwise, a society without that doesn't function well. And so we have a few minutes to, to before closing, and I would like to hear from you what, um, what is your vision of how uh, we can really move forward, but with a sense of urgency of uh, what other actions uh, you will take, what, um, what, what do you think we could, uh, we could actually do to make this uh, a more trusting world? Uh, one of the things that I have to mention, I can't pass this, is uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, changes in our society regarding trust happened 40 years ago when suddenly microfinance started to exist. I know you think, why does this have to do? Well, microfinance is the first time people are loaned money without any really, there's no collateral, just social collateral. And so that was a big, big leap of faith on people. And, and then it became uh, the idea that when the poor women were given this amount of money, they would actually spend it on their kids and on their on education and their roof because the idea was that they wanted a better world for them. So that was key in trust. So how do you see moving forward? Do you see that, for example, uh, another organiz another initiative out there that is called, in Spanish is moneda par, or uh, trust currency, that is a parallel currency that, has, that, ha that happens in other countries. That's another way that is where only trust uh, really makes that a community work with a, a, a money that is created for that community. I don't know if you heard about it, um, but it's it's like an amazing trust uh, initiative. So how how do you think? What are the things out there that are already in existence that need to be really uh, um, uh, expanded, revealed, uh, uh, talked about, uh, talked in the social media as the key elements that bring trust in humans and people and with families and communities and governments. Karen, <laughs> we have only a few minutes left. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll be, I'll be quick. Uh, and, and just to say that, again, to me, it's, uh, it's about uh, communication and, and, and creating safe spaces for people to be able to speak their, their truth or their needs. Um, their differences and that there's not an immediate judgment because what happens is that when we're speaking or you, we know um, we're not really listening sometimes we're having a rebuttal that we're already having in a conversation that's happening in our heads but we're not really listening so I think you know communication it cannot be more emphasized in creating safe space and just one point that I want to make around happiness that what we what we mean by that is is well being. So there's happiness in the positive emotions that we feel, but then there's the other components of purpose, service, meaning, values, and that's really it's a combination of the cognitive and the emotional that brings this this uh, definition of happiness or well being. So meaning and purpose absolutely are key to be able to elevate uh, 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 happiness. But uh, but on the um, on the trust conversation, I think it's creating space for these conversations to happen. I'm interested in hearing Lauren's point of view on this. Well, I, funny enough, uh, Laura, thanks for giving us the opportunity to answer these questions. Karen, again, we're very much on the same page. We're working with a for-profit that are creating um, a project called Tribes, and Tribes will be uh, uh, communities of purpose. Um, and I honestly believe that we're going to see over the next few years a dramatic increase in people power where people with single purpose will come together um, uh, within certain platforms to make a difference, not for entertainment, but actually to get something done. Um, and so I think what we may be watching is a revolution um, with a devolution of real power uh, downwards. Uh, and the recognition that if we come together as communities of purpose, that's where the trust will be, that's where we'll get the biggest results, and that will have the most impact. If those, if those communities, 
in addition to supporting each other, say have the right to vote, you might get 50 million people in a, in a community like that. That's a huge amount of voting. Uh, and it'll be global. Of course, it won't be national. But I can see a dissolving of the nation state. Most people are just fed up with the nation state. Um, that seems to serve its own purpose and not the, those of its individual people. So I won't go on because I'm very interested to hear what Rai has to say. But Karen, I'm absolutely with you. I think it has to do with uh, uh, purpose and in that purpose, trust is built and in that trust, things happen. Too. The, of course, World War II prompted this explosion of, of service, principally through the military, uh, but there's many different ways to, to serve uh, that are out of uniform as well. But, but by, by, by about a quarter of the adult population had served throughout much of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Well, that population now in the United States is less than 1% that have served in uniform and, about, and less than the percent that have served in other capacities, such as AmeriCorps. And that's why this group of veterans that we support in the Congress from both parties has really prioritized the expansion of voluntary national service. Um, because military service is great for, for some people, but it's not for everybody as well. So what happened last week is that the, for the first time in, since its beginning, AmeriCorps began in 1994, for the first time, it has expanded. It's going to expand by 50% over the next two years to help get kids into uh, high school graduates and college graduates to help our, our K through 12 schools rebound, help distribute vaccines, be on the front lines of the pandemic uh, relief efforts. And that's a very positive thing, not only for the immediate impact that it has uh, in these communities and they, AmeriCorps works through grassroots local nonprofits, but also on the impact that it has in those individuals' lives. Um, you know, service forces you out of your comfort zone. It forces you to be able to talk to somebody that doesn't look like you, that doesn't have the same values of you necessarily, or, or, or they, where you have shared values, but you don't necessarily as, as assume it. And again, that, that breakdown, it's, it's much easier to not trust somebody if you have no real contact with them. Um, and so, uh, so, yeah, just ending on a positive note uh, there about uh, at least one action that has occurred that I think will, um, uh, is, a, is a good step in the right direction. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Karen, Rai, and, and Lawrence. This has been an amazing conversation. I know that we can uh, continue this conversation and keep making a difference. And I think the, the, the four of us will, will really on the very soon get some action going on all the suggestions that were uh, mentioned here. Because without trust, there is no society. So we need to, we need to really work on, on that value in a big way. So thank you again and thank you everybody for, for joining this.